All right, so I am recording. All right, so let me see. Does the student club want to do any announcements? Sean? No? We're good? <laughs> so the Computer Science Student Club is meeting today at 1.30, you know, same room here. So if you're interested, you know, I will probably see some of you at the at the student club meeting. Um, and today we'll talk, I will talk a little bit about using GitHub, you know, and also, you know, how to use Git, you know, on the command line. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you know, I will have a really, really short presentation because I got double booked on my time. <clears throat> so there we go. All right. So. Now we're going to go back to our usual material. Okay. So the announcement, you know, we go back to the tentative date of exam one and more on this on Thursday's lecture. So we'll go ahead and take a look at this announcement. And did I send you guys the exam from, yeah, I did. Okay. So I'm just going to bring this up. Okay. I want you guys to kind of at least, you know, take a look at this. Over the weekend, um, this exam is a little bit. Our exam is going to be different this semester, uh, mostly because you know I changed the timeline a little bit. There were some topics you know that I covered in the spring that I completely did not talk about this semester. So the idea is I want to move some of the content out of the way so I have more time to actually talk about the programming part of this class. So let me kind of tell you what you need to do when you are taking, when you attempt you know, this exam by yourself. So question one is, is a difficult one, okay, until you really, really study the material, okay? So the whole idea of giving you this ahead of time is so that you can study, okay? So that you know what you need to study and, you know, to what point do you need to understand the material. So use this time to kind of give yourself a little bit more time to study and really understand the material. I will go over the answer of question number one on next Tuesday, okay? So next Tuesday is when I go over the actual um, answers to the practice exam, which is actually the actual exam from last semester. So this one is, it looks a little long, okay? You know, and you know, you can go ahead and give it a try. Uh, question two, for the most part, is still applicable but some of these questions are not applicable anymore. Um, I'm going to say it's not applicable. So cross out question number two, because we did not talk about the borrow look ahead subtractor. So don't answer question number two. You won't have enough knowledge to answer the question. And then question number three is something that you should be able to answer because this one is about signed interpretation, whose complement, range of values, and so on. So so questions number one and three are applicable to this class. Question number two is not. All right. So question number one, as I said a little bit earlier, will take you some time, okay, because it is a problem-solving kind of question. In other words, once you understand all the material in this class, this is kind of like a logical puzzle that you have to solve, okay? Um, so allow yourself a little bit more time to kind of get used to what the question is asking. Um, and for those of you who want to upload this to ChatGPT and see and see what ChatGPT has to say about this, feel free to do so, okay? Because you know, your exam is not going to be the same as this one for sure. So that means you, know, you can use this and use ChatGPT to help you study. Um, one thing that is super important is to read this portion. Now, obviously, the date and the time will be different for this class, but for the most part, it's going to be the same, which means you are allowed to bring any amount of material that is either handwritten or printed with you in the exam. So it's open book and open notes. Okay? So you have to plan ahead of time, okay? Because you know, some people just print everything that I have given them. It's not going to be super helpful because you, know, you need to know where to find the definitions, the equations, and so on and so forth, which means having your own notes is going to be important. Okay, so all this time, you should have been developing your own study guide, which is basically your own notes here on the material. 
So if you have not done that, you know, we still have time because the actual exam for this class is October 1st. So that's about, about you know, what, 12 days later, okay? So you still got plenty of time to kind of go over the material, you know, get your, you know, get your own notes, you're up and running. And as a backup, you are more than welcome to print everything that is here on Canvas, as well as your know, screenshots you know, of the video recording. So all of those are fine, as long as they're on a piece of paper, you know, or on a pile of paper, okay? So do we have any questions about, you know, what I consider as open book and open notes? Any questions? All right. <clears throat> all right, so I will kind of close this for now. Um, until next Tuesday, then I'll go ahead and talk about the solution and also how to approach your, your thinking of the solution. <clears throat> and my suggestion is for you guys to go through this first, okay? Even if you cannot solve all the questions, if, you know, getting through you know, all this material and at, at least think about it first, it's going to be helpful because when I talk about the solution next Tuesday, things will sink in a lot faster if you have already put in some time to think about how to answer those questions. So there is that. So what we'll do today is I am actually going to stop the discussion of floating point numbers because we have already talked enough about floating point numbers so that we can actually do the conversion. <clears throat> so do we have any questions before we move on to the next topic? Because even though there are quite a few more you know, sections in the floating point module. I'm not going to go over those you know, particular modules because I, once again, I want to save some time to talk more about the actual programming side of this class. So the actual, um, okay, so let, let me, let me get, show you what I mean by that. Okay, so here we go. And here. So in the past, okay, I also spent a lot of time to talk about the conversion from base 10 scientific notation to double, okay? And a lot, some of that has to do with the parsing of the number, and part of that has to do with um, you know, the actual process. When you have a base 10 representation of a number, how do you convert that into a double, which is a binary uh, scientific notation? So there's a lot of stuff here. And there are two homework assignments you know, associated with all this material. So I'm cutting all of, that, all of that stuff out, okay? So basically, all we are doing is really just you know, covering the actual representation of what a, what a double is, and also just spend a little bit of time to talk about the range of a double, and that's it, okay? That is all that I'm going to go over with the double, all right? So I don't want you guys to spend too much time to talk to basically read the rest of this. So let me go ahead and just kind of cover the range, you know, value range of a double. So the range of the double mostly has to do with the exponent. So the exponent, when the, um, the 11 bits, okay, let me go back here and go to the Wikipedia page because that actually has a picture. So let's go take a look at the picture right here. So the range of a double mostly has to do with the green portion and not so much you know, the pink portion. Because the green portion specifies the exponent of 2 and it is biased, okay? But the bottom line is you can specify anything from 2 to the power of negative 1023 to positive 1023. Okay, so that gives you a, a huge range of the exponent. So it can get to a value that is really, really small, you know, like you know, um, 1 divided by 2 to the power of 1023, okay? That's a really, really small value in terms of how close it is to 0. Or it can get all the way up to uh, 1002 to the power of 1024, okay? I, I misspoke a little bit earlier, okay? So the largest value is going to be in the range or in the order of 2 to the power of 1024, which is a really, really large value. So that's about, you know, all we're going to do about, you know, floating point numbers. All right. So do we have any questions about, you know, 
the, the whole concept of a double. Today's lab is still on floating point numbers, okay? You know, so we're gonna stay on floating point numbers in terms of the homework assignment, or not homework assignment, for the lab. But in terms of the topic, we're transitioning to a pretty much all new topic you know, today, which is not in the scope of exam two. So exam two is only going to cover up to and in, including double uh, representation, but not on the topic that we are gonna start today. Yes. Hmm? Do you mean exam? What? Exam one. Exam one. Yes, I misspoke. Yes, I keep telling people I make a perfect spy, because you know even though I did not mean to say something wrong, it comes out wrong. So I would pass a lie detector because technically it is not a lie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you got a question. Oh yeah, when when is the exam one? When is exam one? Okay, so we got to read the announcements, okay? The announcements is important, okay? So if we go to the announcements, yep, got to keep up with all this stuff, okay? So the tentative date of exam one, which is now actually concrete, is October 1st. So make sure that, you know, we get all the announcements. Um, if you're not getting the announcements by email, uh, make sure that you configure Canvas to send you email for each announcement so that this way you don't have to rely on actually signing into Canvas to check the announcement. All right, so with all that said, now we are moving on to a whole new topic and we're gonna ease into the topic because we're getting to the next module which is called the Vorneman, Vorneman uh, Architecture and Memory. So a little bit of history helps, okay? So the first, you know, thing is who's Vorneman? Von Neumann, okay. And you can see that he is a, a Hungarian American mathematician and physicist, okay. But it's, he's actually a lot more interesting than just that, okay. <clears throat> um, as a scientist and a mathematician, as a you know, scholar, I should say, he is good at a lot of things. So we'll go ahead and just you know, read this section here. Um, he said, it says right here, he is a mathematician, a physicist, a computer scientist, and, a, and an engineer. And the fields, the individual fields that he's good at includes math, physics, economics, computing, and statistics. The funny thing is, um, no matter which field you go into, and you ask the experts at the time when he was alive, and you ask, who's the best guy in your field? It's always him. So he's good at multiple fields at the same time, and he excels at each and every single one of those. Okay. So in some way, he is not like Einstein, okay? Because he actually overlapped with Einstein. I think they both taught at Princeton University for a short amount of time in, on the same hall because they're both physicists. Einstein is very introverted. He likes you know, to be surrounded with the quiet, perhaps you know, maybe classical music, but otherwise he doesn't like noise. Um, John Bonneman, on the other hand, being a Hungar Hungarian, likes polka music of all things. So you know, he is always you know, kind of like the noisy one along the hallway, and I think there are you know, stories about, you know, how he and uh, Einstein interacted, interact, you know, when they were both teaching at Princeton University. So, fascinating guy, fascinating person. He probably, you know, you may not have heard much about him because he passed away, you know, really early. So, if you look at his birth, it is 1903, and he passed away in 1957. In other words, he passed away when he was only 54. So you ask, you guys are all pretty young, okay? <clears throat> so you go like, 54, that's pretty old. Okay, I'm 56, okay? <laughs> so that gives you an idea of how early he passed away. Um, he was also involved in the hydrogen bomb project, and many people think that he might have received you know, too much radiation because of the experiments involved in making the hydrogen bomb, and that's why he uh, he died from cancer, basically. All right, so interesting background. 
So the next question is, what is his contribution in computer science? There are a few big names in computer science here historically. The first person is Alan Turing. So who is Alan Turing? Why, why, what is his contribution to computer science? Was he the one that dealt with like electricity? He was the one that Nikola Tesla. Yep. Alan Turing is way after uh, Nikola Tesla. Is he the one who invented the Turing test? He is the one who invented the Turing test? Yes, that was his name. The Turing test, okay, what is the Turing test? What is it? What is the test? Hmm? <laughs> Isn't it basically being able to decipher if something is human or not? Yes. So it's a classification test to see whether a machine can be can be classified as intelligent. So the original test, I believe, was having a computer to be operated remotely, kind of like you know, texting using today's terminology. And if the machine can interact using just a text interface and convince the other side that it is a person, then it has passed the Turing test. Okay? And I can tell you right now, chat GPT easily passes the Turing test. And I can also tell you that I'm not going to pass the Turing test. <laughs> the way I text, the way I write, you know, as you can see from my own writing for the class modules, is not exactly, you know, it is human, but it is not, it, it, has, it has certain properties that make people think that I'm, they're talking to a machine, okay? So anyway, jokes aside, that's Turing, the Turing test. But Alan Turing's main contribution to computer science was actually even more significant. He was the founder of modern day computer science. Without him, that would not have been computer science, or at least not to the point where we are now at you know, here. He was uh, the one who invented a machine to decipher encrypted messages at the end of World War II, and the Germans were communicating using the Enigma machines. So basically, you have a message to send, okay? The Enigma machine looks like a typewriter, so you just type it in, but what is transmitted is, is transmutated, okay? So basically when you type A, okay, it might send I and so on and so forth. It has, uh, I think initially it has four disks to do the um, uh, permutations, and then later on they add a fifth disk to the whole thing. When the disk number was only four, it was humanly possible to de decipher the messages, so the British intelligence was able to decipher German encrypted messages when there were only four disks. When they added a fifth disk, it became infeasible for humans to decipher the messages, and Turing was the one who helped design and build the machine that can automatically decipher those messages. So have, have, haven't you guys watched uh, an imitation game? Okay, so that that's Alan Turing, okay? And the whole point of, quote unquote, the imitation game was at one point in his life, a later stage, after his best friend died, he wanted to use a machine to imitate his best friend. So that was his interest in artificial intelligence, was can I put my, the soul of my best friend in a machine so I can have conversation with my friend. All right, so the next person in line for computer science to progress to the point where we are now is actually this guy. John Bonneman. So now I have to give you an idea of why he is important. Okay, so I'm going to give you wire wrap computers from the 1950s. Okay. All right, so these are really good pictures. <laughs> they are basically the same picture. So I'm going to look, take a look at this one. There we go. And put this one on its own tab. Okay, maybe. Yep, that works. Okay, so we are, we are now taking a picture of, this is a picture of what computers used to look like. Massive amount of interconnections because the wiring is the only thing 
that dictates you know, what the computer is going to do. Okay, there's no such thing as programming a computer using a keyboard or using punch cards, nothing, okay? If you want to change the behavior of a program, okay, of a computer, you have to go to the back of the computer and rewire, okay, how components are connected. So imagine this you know, with your cell phone, okay? There's no over-the-air updates anymore, okay? If you, want to, if you want to change the programming of your phone, you have to take it back to T-Mobile or whatever provider, and then that person has to unscrew, take apart the entire computer or your phone, okay? And there will be microscopic wires going in every direction, and that person will have to disconnect many of those connections Look at the diagram and go like, how am I supposed to update you know, the wiring and reconnect all the wires? And then all this time, you're gonna have your fingers crossed to make to say that I hope there's nothing going wrong this time, okay? Because it will go wrong, okay? So this is what computer used to look like. There's no such thing as programming. You cannot change the behavior of a program or a computer without physically rewiring the components. So. Alan Turing's, not Alan, uh, uh, John Bonneman's you know, co contribution to computer science, you can actually get to, um, if, you, I, if I just look for architecture, um, let's see, let me see if I can get to the actual mentioning, nope, okay. So basically his contribution is to change the way we look at the behavior of a computer because the computers back in those times already had memory because they need memory in order to store the data being processed. Um, these computers, uh, I think one of these was used to compute the trajectory of shells of battleships, okay? So they need to have memory already to store all the information, all the data, all the numbers, and so on and so forth, but the memory was not used to specify the behavior of the computer. So his contribution is to say, okay, but what if, okay, we have a mechanism so that we can use the computer's memory not only to store the data, the numbers, you know, the information that to be processed, but also to store what we want the computer to do, okay, instructions per se, okay? And that one idea, okay, of, you know, just saying, okay, let's use the computer's memory to also specify the behavior of the computer changed basically everything. Along with you know, making transistors a lot smaller, but that's not just him, that's you know, basically decades of progress in technology. So that's his contribution, okay? That's why most computers, including our usual laptop computer, um, your cell phones, your you know, fitness watch, and so on and so forth, most of those are still using the von Neumann architecture. There are a few architectures that are called the Harford architecture, and they are a slight modification of the von Neumann architecture. But at the end of the day, okay, even the Harford architectures can be seen as a specialized and slightly more optimal version of the von Neumann architecture. So this is around since the, the 50s, okay? Um, so since I was talking about the fathers of computer science, now I know it's a gender, kind of not very gender neutral way to describe it, but so far, you know, most of the people who made contributions, you know, so the next two are, one is Donald Knuth, okay? And the other one is, I think, Edgar uh, Dijkstra. Okay, so those are the other two because they made, uh, they derived a lot of the algorithms that we use these days. Um, like quicksort, merge sort, and a few other you know, famous you know, algorithms. All right, so kind of a general background you know, of his contribution. So now we get back to the itty gritty detail of you know, what we need to know. So the first one was you know, D flip flop and other basic memory devices. And I moved, I just moved this you know, into GitHub this morning. And I think I got everything fixed, so we'll see. So the first thing is we introduce, we're going to introduce what we call an SR latch. So the SR latch can be defined you know, using this text description. So you go like 
uh, why are we using a text description to describe you know, the S R latch? It is because even though LogiSim is very visual, it's easy to see how things are connected, it is not the best way to describe or to specify a circuit. Why do you think that is the case? Okay, let me, let me rephrase the question. There are many ways you know, to write a program, okay? Um, you guys are coming from CISP 360, so C++ is one way to describe a program. And then there are other ways to describe a program, such as graphical programming languages. Uh, one is called Scratch, okay? In case you have not, you don't know what Scratch is, let me show you what Scratch is. So Scratch from MIT, is a visual programming language. So when you go to any one of these, these are programs written by other people. And they also let you take a look at the program itself. So let me see where the, the code is. See inside, there we go. So basically, the whole thing is made out of these blocks. You just drag and drop the blocks, you know, and make connections, connections to specify a program. So what do you think is the trade-off between this versus you know, just a C++ program using using just a text editor? Okay, that's one. But this is also not very concise, okay? If you want to make any changes to your program, it is cumbersome. So even though it looks really intuitive, we can see, oh, here's a while block inside a conditional block, and this is a block that specifies the condition of the loop, and so on and so forth. It is not easy to put a program together. If you have not tried this before, I encourage you to try it, okay? Just make a simple, um, bubble sort algorithm, okay? You can do it, okay? There's no doubt you can do it. But to construct that program, you're gonna use the mouse a whole lot more than you use the keyboard because you're not gonna be typing. You'll be dragging and dropping blocks, okay? Okay, in other words, it, is a, it's, it, it works for beginners really well, okay? Because you don't have to learn any syntax. But at the same time, it is a not a very um, it's not a very good representation when things get complicated. Okay, so I'm going to close this, and let me ask you: of all the circuits that we have seen so far, do you think they are complicated circuits? Not by any measure are those considered complicated circuits. How many transistors are inside a modern day? Intel or AMD, your main processor. I think it's more than that, but we'll we'll take a look. Okay, so we can just ask the question: How many how many transistors are in an i5 processor? Okay, kind of middle of the line, not to the top end, not the bottom. Okay, yeah, not five million. My Okay, this is just an educated guess. We can actually go for some more. Oh, so you're correct. So in trillions. <laughs> okay, 5.3 trillion transistors on a, um, what is this? This is flash memory and even for any processor in 2020, okay, this is on in 2020, any processor, uh, the number of transistors is 2.6 trillion. How many millions do we have in a trillion? Billion? Hmm? Billion? 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 A trillion. So how many millions do we have in a trillion? A million million, yep, okay. So can you imagine, you know, if you were to use LogiSim <laughs> to specify you know, what is inside the processor, what your LogiSim diagram is going to look like? How long it would take to make it. Exactly. Okay. 
So that's not a good way to specify your what is inside the processor. So when you want to actually design processors, and some of you may actually want to consider go to your job, um, which is a computer engineer, uh, we use programming languages to specify how components are connected inside the processor. There are two programming languages for that. One is called VHDL, which stands for, uh, HDL stands for Hardware Description Language. I cannot remember what the V stands for. The other one is called Verilog, which is a, uh, a language that was not really by design for hardware description language, but it was kind of used for that purpose. So these are the two main languages used to describe you know, the components and how things are connected inside the processor. If anyone here is planning to transfer to UC Berkeley with their ECS or electrical computer science you know, program, uh, the final year project is to enhance in a current, to enhance a given computer architecture to have some additional you know, features. But those are all specified in either Verilog or VHDL, okay? Because you know, the, the, the library alone for these things is huge, okay? So that is why you know, in this class, I'm also transitioning to, okay, I'm just closing all the things that I need to, that I don't need. So that's why I'm also going to use text here just, to, just so that you can get start to get used to the idea of, oh, okay, we can describe a circuit using just text. So let's take a look at what this stands for, okay? So this is kind of like a type you know, or a class. We have two objects or two variables. One is called N1 and one is called N2, and those are two NAND2 gates. And then we have two input pins. Uh, one is called S, one is called R. We have two output pins, one is called Q, one is called NQ. So basically the first three lines basically just name the components that we're gonna need in the circuit. And then these four lines is specifying what we call the electrical nodes. E each node is connecting pins on a particular component to possibly pins of the same component or on a different component. So in this case, you know, S is an input pin the pin on the input pin is connected to the first input of N1 as a gate. On, this, on the other hand, this is R as an input pin. It is connected to the second input of N2 and so on. Okay. So what I'll do next is I'm going to give you the actual logistic diagram so that we can talk about it you know, in the diagram. So we'll go ahead and do that. And let me get this started here. And put this over here. All right. So I'm going to create you know, the diagram of a SR latch. So we have two input pins. Okay. One, two. We have two output pins. Here's one. Here's the second one. And then we have two NAND gates. So we go to gates, we go to NAND, and then we specify it to be a narrow one. And the number of input is going to be just two. And we need two of those. Okay, so here's one, control D, duplicate, and I can move the other one down about here. So when we read the instructions, let me go back to the instructions a little bit. Okay. We want to connect S to the first input of N1, okay? So maybe it helps to name the components too. So let me do just that. This is input pin S. This is input pin R. This is output pin Q. This is output pin Q, NQ. Oh, not NQ, NQ. There we go. This is N1, okay, our first NAND gate, N1. And this is our second NAND gate, which is N2. Oops, uh, cancel. This is N2. All right, so we want S as an input pin to connect to the first input of N1. We want R to connect to the second input of N2. So the next two nodes are the interesting ones. 
So let's go take a look at the next two nodes. We want the output of N1 to connect to the input of N2, but also to the output pin P. So the way that works is kind of like this. Okay, This goes to output pin Q, but it also goes back. Okay, let me see what is the best way to do this. I think this is the best way. So it also goes back to here. And then the last one connects the output of N2 to the second input of N1, but also to NQ as an output pin. So the way it is drawn here is going to be something like this. And then it goes back to the second pin of N1. So this is an SR latch. You look at this and go like, hmm, doesn't look too complicated, you know, because you know, we we have already talked about a certain types of logic gates, or certain, uh, I should say, certain types of circuits that make use of two NAND gates, right? And because we can use NAND gates to emulate an OR or to emulate a regular AND, okay? And so having two NAND gates is no big deal. But this circuit is interesting because the output of one goes to the input of the other one and vice versa too. So that means you know, when we need to analyze what this circuit is going to do, it's going to be a little bit more you know, involved. Okay. So do we have any questions about the circuit itself, you know, how it is connecting all the components? Questions? Okay. So if we don't have any questions about this, then the next question is, all right, so assuming that we don't know anything about this, okay, you can go to simulate, disable, and then reset the simulation. So this way, you know, um, the simulation itself is not working. We, we need to do everything by hand, okay? So the first thing we want to ask is, um, what if we make both input pins zeros. Knowing nothing about the NAND gates, how are we going to figure out what this circuit is going to do? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. But to do that, I think the first thing we need to do, okay, um, is to use, we need a tracking mechanism to figure out, you know, how things are being changed. So the way I'm doing this is to put the diagram here, uh, there are a few ways to do this. Mm, okay, I, I'll do it in a slightly different way. Give me a second here. So shift print screen. What I'm doing is I'm extracting a picture of the circuit and put it on a in a window, and that window is going to stay up. Okay, so we'll say this is going to be always on top. And then I'll make a new spreadsheet. Okay, so we'll go to drive.google.com, go to my drive, and go to this class, and then go to shared. So this way, the spreadsheet that I'm making right now is visible to you even right now. So go we'll create a new sheet, and I'll name the new sheet using today's date, which is 2024. Uh, 0919. Okay. All right. So a spreadsheet is in this case just used for, I'm just using it to track all the changes. So let me make more area available to do a tracking. All right. So the first thing we need to do is to figure out you know, where are all the connection points. Okay. In other words, um, S has one connection point, N1 has three connection points because it has two inputs and one output. Um, N2 also has three connection points. Q has one connection point. NQ also only has one connection point. So we're going to enumerate all of those. So we have S has one, which is just the pin. R only has one, which is just the pin. N1 has two inputs. Okay, So this is the first input. This is the second input. Oops, one. And then this is the output of N1, 
and the N2 is kind of the same deal. It has the first input. N2 has the second input. And then N2 has an output. And then last, we have Q, which only has an output pin. So there's only one connection point. And then NQ also only has one connection point. So I'm going to make these columns narrower because you know, that way everything shows you know, a little better in this spreadsheet. So I now make everything narrower just like that. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit too narrow for some of the pins. So let me change that a little bit. Just make it slightly wider like that. Okay. Do we have any questions about what each column is representing? Every column is representing a point of one component in the circuit. In other words, if you are to go to the logistic circuit, okay, let me pull the logistic circuit back here. If you hover your pointer over anything, anything that turns into a circle like this, like this, like this, has one column representing it in the spreadsheet. Are we doing okay so far with that? Okay. The second thing we also need to do, oh, I don't want to close that just yet. Okay, so the second thing we also need to do is to figure out which ones are actually logically connected. So we can see that S pin and N1.in0 are connected. So we say, okay, they are belonging to the same node and we call that node zero, okay? So we say these two are connected. R, on the other hand, has is belongs to a separate node. It is connected to n2.1, n2.in1. So this is the second node. And then um, the output of n1 connects to q. So this is our third node. It connects to q, but also to n2.in bracket zero. And then the fourth node that we have connects the output of N2 to NQ and also to the second input pin of N1. So that means you know, what row one is trying to say is uh, tell me which node that component is connected to. If two components share the same node number, like this one versus this one, oops, not that one, this one, that means they're connected to the same node because they have the same node ID or node number. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so I think I'm going to also make one more column to the left, insert one to the left, and now we are ready to go, okay? So the first thing is knowing nothing ahead of time, I am changing, okay, whatever from whatever it used to be before, I'm changing S to zero. I'm also changing R to zero. And we want to figure out you know, what is going to happen to the circuit. So that means you know, we are putting a zero here as well as a zero here. So those are the values that we're putting into the system. My watch just buzzed me, so I think we're going to go take the row first. So go ahead and sign into Canvas. And the row taking thing is actually still with the floating thing. It's right here. And let me publish it. The access code is overflow. I'll put it on the whiteboard. So are we done taking bow? Okay. All right. So now the question is, if I'm putting a zero here and I'm putting a zero here, um, based on just how the nodes are connecting the pins, 
um, which other nodes or which other column would also automatically get a zero because of this. So if you look at the diagram, it is actually clear because S is a zero. Don't you think the first input of N1 is also going to be zero just because you know, they are wired in that particular way? Okay, so we're gonna go like, okay, so because of that, this is gonna be a zero because they are sharing the same node. What about the other one? N2, the second input of N2 should also get a zero because R is a zero. So we go to the second input of N2 and then we say, okay, you're also going to get a zero here because of the connectivity of the nodes. Is that okay? So this particular row, row three of the spreadsheet, has to do with node connectivity, and I abbreviate it to just NC. So let me say that one more time. NC stands for node connectivity. A node is basically electrically what components are connected together. That is a node. So because of how the wires are specified, we now know that, okay, so all of these pins should get zeros. Is that okay? But what about the other ones? What about Q and NQ and the output of M1 and the output of N2? All of those are considered unknown at this point. Okay. So if I want to kind of state the initial state, state the initial condition of this entire thing, this is what I can do. Z. I'm still trying to get used to my uh, touchpad. Okay, so these are all, you know, basically initially, they were, they're all unknown. We know nothing about <clears throat> the state of each of the pins. So as we specify the input of S and R, we try to, we are trying to figure out what happens to the rest of the circuit. All right. So are we still doing okay so far? So now the question is, if I know that one of the input pins of N1 is a zero, one of the input pins of N2 is also a zero, um, how long would it take for the output of N1 or N2 uh, to change? So there's a slight delay to do this. Let me try to explain to you why there is a slight delay. So we go back to Logisim, and let me go to a new circuit this time, add a new circuit. Uh, we just call this, um, it's a temporary circuit. I don't really intend to do anything useful here. But we go back to wiring, and then we go back to transistors. All I need, or all I want to do is to really just illustrate the various parts of a transistor. So we know that this is called a gate. We know this is called the source, and this is called the drain. We know, you know this is source, and this is drain because of the direction of the flow. Okay? That is not even the whole point. The whole point is, do you see there's a little bar here, and there's another bar over here? What does that resemble? How many of you have taken electrical circuit in the physics class? Okay, anyone? Is anyone taking any classes in electronic technology? Okay, so what is, this is the symbol, I just want you guys to tell me what it is. Condensator. Hmm? Condensator. It's a what? Condensator. Condensator? It's a capacitor. It's a capacitor. Yeah, it's a capacitor. So a capacitor is kind of like a cup, okay? It can hold, not water, a charge, okay? So, and the thing about the capacitor is um, it, because it's a cup, you are basically, you know, the electrical wire is kind of like a tube, you know, that, like a garden hose, okay? You have a bucket, which is a capacitor, and then the wires inside the circuit, they're more like, you know, garden hoses, okay? The garden hoses, even though in theory, they can flow, they can make water flow as quickly as possible, that is never the case, okay? Because every garden hose has a maximum flow rate, okay? You can only flow like, you know, maybe a, a gallon, you know, 20 gallon per minute, okay, which is a lot, okay? So in order to charge a capacitor, it takes time. In other words, when you look at a transistor like this, it also takes time. This is what we call the gate, but in order for the transistor to go from off to on, or to go from on to off, 
it takes time because you're either filling a bucket or you're draining a bucket at a certain flow rate. So it cannot happen instantaneously. It just takes time to fill up the bucket or it takes time to drain the bucket. Is that concept okay? The bottom line is in this class, okay, this is not a device physics class. We're not in electrical engineering. All we need to know is if you change the state of the gate of a transistor, it takes time. There's a slight delay between the change of the gate versus whether the device is actually on or off. I'll be okay with that concept. There's just a slight delay. So that delay is called a propagational delay. Okay, so if you want to look up the term, it is called a propagational delay. And it is, I did not invent that term. Okay, you can look it up. It's called a propagational delay. And there we go. Propagational delay is the amount of time required for a signal, which is you know, basically a zero or one in our case, to be received after it has been sent. It is also caused by the time it takes for the signal to travel through a medium. So we can kind of add a little bit more to this um, circuit. And computer, okay, in this context, propagational delay de is defined as the amount of time required after an input signal is applied and has stabilized to the input of a circuit to the time that the output of the circuit has been stabilized to the correct output signal. Is that okay? Okay, this is just a really long version of what I, what I said, okay? But the whole point is, you got buckets, you got garden hoses, okay? And it takes time, if you turn on the garden hose, it takes time for the bucket to be filled. If you want to drain the bucket using a garden hose, it also takes time for the bucket to become empty, okay? So, what does that have anything to do with what we are doing here? Well, it has to do with from the time you make a change to this point, it takes some time before it changes the output. Same thing over here. From the time we know the input, the second input of N2 is a zero, it takes a certain amount of time before the output of N2 is going to change. So that is called a propagational delay. The amount of time is called a propagational delay. So this row is reflecting after a propagational delay can we make any conclusions? What do you guys think? <clears throat> we know one of the input of N1 is now a zero. So after a propagational delay, can we tell something about the output of N1 without knowing what the second input pin is? Okay, it has to be a one. Good job, okay? So we know that N1's output should be a one and for the same reason, N2 output should also be a 1. Why? Why did you guys know that, oh, it's going to be a 1? Even though we do not know both input pins, we just know one of the input pins. Why? Because of the truth table NAND. Because of the truth table of NAND. Very good. Okay. So what does that look like for NAND? So let's go ahead and take a look, okay? Because I want you guys to fully understand how the reasoning works. So we will take a look at the behavior of a NAND gate. So we'll just say this is the NAND gate. This is input, the first input. This is the second input. This is the output. So what does the truth table has how many rows? Four. Four, very good. So false, false, true, true. And then we have false, whoops. False, true, false, true. And then the output is? One. Mm -hmm. That is correct. So how is this truth table helping us in terms of the other sheet? How can we make this determination of a one when only one of the input is known for N1? Let's go back to sheet two. So we know N1 is a zero, right? So that means you know, we are confirming this or this. We don't know which one, okay? Because we never say anything about what N1 looks like. But do we really care? Because if you look at the output, oh, it doesn't care. The output does not really need to rely on in one when in zero is already a zero. That is why we can basically short circuit the whole reasoning and go like, oh, okay, we don't need to know what is in one. As soon as we know in zero is a zero, 
the output is going to be a one. Is that reasoning okay? So there's no, there's no actual technical term to describe this kind of reasoning other than it is logic. Okay, it is not Boolean algebra, okay? This is not Boolean algebra because we are not using algebra at all. We are looking at a table and we're trying to make sense of how can I use this table to make this determination? So it's just really logic, okay? So now we go back to here and that's why we can put a one here. And for the same reason we, we can put a one here because for the second NAND gate, we know that, that the second input is a, is a zero. So in that case, we are looking at this row versus this row here. But you can see that it doesn't matter what in zero is for these two rows, the outputs are both ones. So that's why we can also tell that you know, the output has to be a one, even though we only know that the second input of the, the second NAND gate is a zero. Is that okay? Basically the same reasoning, you know, except it's instead of in one, it is in zero, or in, it's in one, instead of in zero, that is correct. Okay, so this is what I call a PD row, okay, which basically means depending on what kind of a device we have, knowing the changes to the input pins, what do we know about the output? Is it gonna be changed? If so, do we know how it is gonna be changed? So in this case, we can determine these two are changed. So now that we are done with the PD, which only accounts for you know, the device specific logic, we go back to another NC row here. We alternate between node connectivity and propagational delay. So the way we, this works is we look at the things that just got changed in the previous row, which are these two ones, and then we ask, uh, where is this one connected to? If you look at the diagram, the output of N1 connects to a few spots, right? It connects to Q, it also connects to the first input of N2. So because of node connectivity, everything that connects to node number two would also get a one in on this row here. So we put a one here. We also going to put, put a one over here. The same thing happens to this particular thing. It belongs to node three. We just made a change to one of the pins of node three. So now we look up node three, here's one, here's one, and here's one. Corresponding to, this is what we just changed, but because of the way the wires are done, this is gonna change accordingly, and also this is also gonna change accordingly. So that's also why we put a one here, okay, here's a one, and everything that belongs to node three now has a one. Is that okay? So once again, NC is representing who else is gonna change just because of the wire. PD, on the other hand, is just determining what is gonna change because of the device, okay? When I say the word device, it is a logic gate, okay? In this case, the NAND2 gate, each one, is called a device. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So now we look at this and go like, oh, well, at least one input pin is now changed. Because if you look at this input pin, okay, let's look at this one first, it changed. It changed from unknown to a one. If you look at uh, this input pin here, it also got changed from unknown to a one. So every time you have a pin that has a state change, then you have to ask, if the input pin of the device has changed, does it affect the output? So now we, we have to go for another PD. So here's another PD. And this time I can focus on just the, the devices, which is N1 and N2, that has an input pin change. So N1 has an input pin change, basically uh, in the second input got changed from unknown to a one. But is that gonna change the output? It's not gonna change the output. It's not changing the output, because in zero is still a zero, and that is already sufficient to determine the output has to be a one. So that means I'm not gonna put anything here because it is not changed. So that's the other thing that is important about the table like this, is if there's no change, don't write anything here. Just leave it as is, because we are using um, 
what is in the cell to indicate a change. Since we don't have a change, we just leave this empty. And N2 is the same way, because even though technically one of the input pins of N2 has changed from unknown to a one, but it is not gonna change the output, right? Because you know, have knowing that in zero is a one, and in one is still a zero, the output is still a one. So that means you know, we are also not gonna put anything here because the output of N2 is not changing. Is that okay? All right. So now we go like, okay. So that means this entire PD is empty. Nothing is changed as a result of propagation of the noise. That means what? It means one thing. There's one term to describe uh, row seven in this case. It is called a steady state. It is called a steady state because no further changes will result after this step. Is that okay? Okay, some of you are writing it down. Very good, okay, I like that, okay? But I'm gonna write this down in the spreadsheet as well. We have reached a steady state. Okay? Well, because this is called a steady state, you probably can imagine that in certain types of connections, there may not be a steady state at all. The circuit will keep changing the state of the components. It will keep going in a circle, okay? And those are called oscillators, okay? Because they keep oscillating between zero and one, so it's called an oscillator. This circuit can be turned into an oscillator, but I'm not gonna talk about that yet, okay? Because it's a more complex type of analysis. So we're gonna go for the easier you know, kind of thing first. All right, so given this is our current state, okay, what is our current state? S is a zero, R is a zero. Um, output pin Q is a one, output pin N2 is also a one. And everything in between are also determined. We know exactly who's a one and who's a zero. So now we go like, okay, what if we are going to change one of these pins from a zero to a one, okay? I'll let you guys pick. Pick one of them. Change one of the input pins from a zero to a one and then we'll do the analysis. S, okay, all right. So we, we're now going to say, okay, let's go ahead and change S from a zero to a one. It is an input pin, which means the outside has a say of what the state of that pin is gonna be. So the first thing we do is an NC which basically means, okay, so if we are changing this zero to a one, who else is also gonna to change to a one like right away because of how things are wired? You guys can tell me which column should I also change to a one because we changed input pin S to a one. Hmm? First input of N1. First input of N1 and that will be column D. Column D, very good. So column D is also going to get one here because they are connected to the same node and the node ID is node zero, okay? I'm just using a number as an ID. Very good. So now we, uh, do we need to go through a PD? Because in other words, is the NC row on, or basically row eight, did that change the input of at least one component? Yes, right, because we, as you said, we just changed the first input of one of the NAND gates. So that means we, we are now forced, we, it's mandatory that we have to go for a PD. Because you know, if you change the input of anything, you have to analyze and see whether that one change is gonna cause the output of the device to change. Is that okay? So now we look at N1, okay, basically N1 is corresponding to these three columns, and this is the output. So now we have to say, um, is the output of N1 going to change as a result of the first input changing to a one? The answer is yes, because now we know both inputs of N1, they're both, they're both ones. And when both inputs of N1 are ones, the output needs to be a zero. Is it already a zero? Nope. 
If it's not already a zero, then you have to say, okay, we are now changing it to a zero. So when you put a number on a particular cell, you're indicating we are now changing it to this particular value. Are we good? And what about N2? Do we have to do something about N2? Does the previous row of N2 change any of the inputs of N2? No. So that means we don't have to do anything about N2, not right now, okay? Not right away. So this is the end of PD, but because the PD ends up with one change, okay? So on a PD row, if there's at least one change, then you have to go for another NC. Because the change of the PD is not taking into consideration of the node connectivity. So you need a separate row of NC to use the node connectivity to know how this, is, this change is gonna spread in the circuit. Is that okay? So now we look at this and go like, okay, node number two needs to be changed. Who else is on number two? So we know this is on node number two. So it has to be changed to the same thing. This also belongs to node number two. Also has to be changed to the same thing. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So I'm going to pull a little trick here, okay? With almost every single spreadsheet program, you can do something like this. So this way I can scroll the bottom part you know, without scrolling the entire thing. Um, given what we're dealing with here, I'm going to maximize the screen too, just so that I have more rows to play with. All right, so if we look at NC, did we change the output of one of the components? Did we change one of the inputs of, of the components? Uh, which one got changed? Yep. Column G tells us that the first input of N2 just got changed. So anytime you change the input of a particular device, you have to go for another PD row to see if the output is also going to change because of the input change. So now we are focusing on just this zero here, and this zero, or this particular column, belongs to N2 as a device. So we are now asking, um, is the output of N2 going to change as a result of the input being changed over here? What do you think? Nope. So even though this input, you know, the first input of N2 got changed from a one to a zero. The second input of N2 remained as a zero the entire time. So that means the output of N2 also remains as a one the entire time. This is not a change. I'm not gonna write anything here. But that's it. Because this change does not change any of the gates because this is really just an output pin. So it's not gonna affect anything else. So that means now we see another PD row that is completely empty, which means we are not, it's not triggering any additional changes anymore. So now we have another steady state. Are we good so far? All right. So the next one, I cannot let you guys you know, determine which pin is gonna change <laughs> because you know, we need to kind of close you know, the entire thing. So the next one is, going to be an NC because I am going to change, um, oh, okay, I, that's a PD. This is the one that needs to be changed to an NC. So the next one I'm going to change is R. I want, I want to change that one to a one as well, okay? So now we ask the question, uh, with an NC, which column needs to be changed? Anything that connects to node number one, so which column? Column H, that is correct. So column H is also corresponding to node one, so that also needs to change to the same value as the other one in uh, on node one. And every time you change the input of a component, you have to go for another PD, and this one here belongs to the second input of N2, so that means you know, we have to go for another PD. The question is, is this change of input two of N1 going to change its output? The answer is no, so that means I don't put anything here. The output remains as a one, so that means we are now at a steady state, and we're done. So what is the conclusion after all of this stuff is done? 
Well, the actual conversion is Q is now a zero and Q is now a one because at the end of the entire session, only the output pins matter, okay? Because you know, the internal state of each component eh, is not as important. Are we good so far? Okay. So what we need to know is you know, the sequence of how we change the input pins result in the output pins of Q being a zero and then an N Q being a one. Are we good so far? So now let me ask you a question. If I were to kind of change this one to here and then change this one to over here, what do you think would have happened? Okay, we can, we can go through that exercise too if you want to. Do you want me to kind of do that? Okay, let's do that. So there's an easy way to do that because I can duplicate a sheet. So we'll duplicate this sheet. <laughs> we'll call this you know, sheet 1A, okay? And then from here, all I want to do is to change everything from here and down. So we'll go ahead and erase this entire thing. And then instead of, this is NC, and this time we are changing R to a one instead of S to a one, okay? So because R is connected to node one, so the other thing on node one also changes to one. And because this is an input pin, the next row has to be a PD. So now we are looking at N2. N2 has one, both inputs are ones. The output has to be a zero, but because it was a one before, it is now a change to a zero, so I have to denote that zero. That forces me to go for another NC again because an output of one device has changed. So everything on node three now need to change from a one to a zero. No, change from a zero to a one. So that would be this one and also the other one that connects to node three. So that also needs to change to a zero. But column E is corresponding to one of the input pins of N1. So now I have to go for another PD to see if the output of N1 is gonna change. So this is the output of N1. Well, it's not gonna change because you know, this is a zero. The output is one already. And having the second input also being a zero does not change the output. So this is now blank. So now I have a blank you know, PD. It is now in a steady state. All right. Last one, okay? Another NC, because this time I will change S from a zero to a one, and everything that belongs to node zero also need to change to a one, and we only got one more column. But because that column corresponds to um, the input of a gate, now we have to determine whether the gate output is gonna change. So in this case, the gate output remains to be a one because the second input of M1 was a zero already, the output has been a one already. So changing the first input from a zero to a one does not change the output because it's still a one. So that means now we have an entire row of PD being empty again, and we have now another steady state. Um, I think I forgot one thing. I definitely forgot one thing. Forget. I know this is not right. Okay, let me let me step back and see if I can spot my own error. This is a one. This is a one. No, nope, I think this is correct. Okay, this is a steady state. Okay, I can go back here. Yep. Okay, so we're so we have both of these you know sheets. And you can see that the only changes you know, of these two sheets is who is getting a zero on the output and who's getting a one. Do you see that? Okay, let me go back. Okay, I'll, I'll go slow this time. So with the first one, where we where, where we change S from a zero to a one first, and then we change R to a one, the output becomes Q being a zero and Q being a one. Okay, so try to remember that. As we transition to the next one, and the only change is the ordering of which of S and R become a one first. But you can see the output 
is also reversed. In this one, Q is now a 1, and N2 is now a 0. Is that OK? Well, isn't that a little strange? Because in the end, OK, if you look at the end, both input pins are ones, but the output pins have different states. As opposed to here, both input pins are ones, but the output pins are also in different states. Is that, is that OK? No? <clears throat> so one way to look at this is how we got there, OK? So um, I cannot do this usually with electronics. So I've got to use the whiteboard to do this. So we started off with uh, S and R both equaling to 0, OK? OK, so that's one state. And then we go from here to we change S to a 1 first, and then R to a 0. And then we go to both being 1. That is sheet 1. Question? No? OK. <laughs> and then the alternative path is to say, let's keep S to be a 0, but we change R to a 1. And then we change S also to a 1, so now both of them are 1. Is that OK? So these are the two paths that we took. On the left, we have sheet 1 in the spreadsheet. This is sheet 1A. By the way, the spreadsheet is available to you right now. Okay, if you go to the shared folder, there's a link at the beginning of the entire Canvas module. If you go there and look for 2014-0919, you'll find the spreadsheet already. So, so you don't have to copy everything down when it is already on the projector. But because of the different path, even though the end state, okay, I don't, yeah, I have to do this because it's on the right side. So even though the end state are both having S and R being ones, the outputs are different. Because in one case, the output is having Q being a zero, and Q being a 1, but in the other one, we have Q being a 1 and N Q being a 0. So the sequence of how we get to the end state matters. Okay? So this is called an SR latch because it is a very interesting you know, memory device because it is remembering. Okay? In this case, it's remembering Q is a 0. In this case, it's remembering that Q is a 1. All right? So I'm going to pause here, OK, partially because we only got two minutes left. But I want to see if you guys have any questions about how we perform the analysis of how changes get propagated in the circuit. Any questions about that? OK. Because this is the foundation of all the other memory devices that we'll be talking about. Now, when you look at the SR latch, it really does not feel like a memory device, OK? It's like, OK, so we have two different ways to get to the end state, but each way ends up with you know, the output being a little bit different, OK? So that's the first impression. But eventually, in this particular module, OK, so let me go back to the module. Oh, I know we have to go here. I can see some of you are already getting there, which is good, okay? That's exactly what I want you guys to do. So when you go to the module, there's the same analysis, okay? So you know, this is basically just me you know, using text to describe what I just used the spreadsheet to express. So in the end, we have a truth table that looks kind of funky. So the truth table says, if S is a zero, R is a zero, we know the output is going to be both ones for Q and N2. Okay? So that's not a not a very special kind of output. If we know S is a zero, R is a one, we know the output has to be Q being a one and Q being a zero. If we know the inputs are one and zero for S and R, 
we also know for sure the output is Q, uh, Q being a zero and Q being a one. So the last row is funky because if we know just the inputs being one and one, the outputs are quote unquote NC, but this time NC does not, is not saying node connectivity. This NC stands for no change. Okay, it basically just says, where, however you get to one one, it will preserve that state from before. Okay, so because of NC preserving whatever it was before, that is the memory aspect of the SR left. It just maintains whatever the outputs were before transitioning to both inputs using one. Is that okay? So that's one thing, okay, because we have a long weekend. I won't see you guys on, for another five days. Those of you who are less fortunate who are taking CISD 440 will see me on Monday. But if you don't see me on Monday, okay, you will see me on Tuesday, which means you have five days in between. So what I want you guys to do is to go through the same analysis process, but you're, you're skipping from zero, zero directly to one, one see what happens, okay? So in other words, is switching directly from zero, zero to one, one, is it preserving both outputs being ones? Because you know, this seems to suggest that, right? But in reality, is that what's gonna happen? Okay, so that's your exercise for over the weekend is to practice what we just talked about today, but apply that to the transition of both S and R being zeros directly to both S and R being ones. And after you do this for, I would say maybe eight rows or so, you will start to see, oh, tech just gave us a tricky you know, assignment because this is not gonna end. Because you'll recognize it's like, isn't this one of the state that we were in earlier? And we doesn't seem like we could ever get to a steady state, okay? So that's a clue, okay? You know, because I don't want you guys to spend like the whole day tracking it down after hundreds and hundreds of rows to go like, this is not ending. Yes, it's not supposed to. But I want you guys to go through the process to find out, oh, okay, this is not ending. Because that's what happens when you transition directly from zero, zero to one, one for the inputs. Are we okay so far? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you the lab for today. Okay, I'm going to return this to the usual height. All right, so we are going for the lab for today. So you got a few things to do over the weekend. One is the uh, exam from spring. Okay, so Give it a try, okay? I know it's gonna be a little bit difficult, but give it a try. And the second one is what I just said, okay? Transitioning from zero, zero to one, one directly. All right, so this is gonna be the second one that relates to floating point numbers. Uh, floating point two, and let it release. Basically, more math stuff here that is related to floating point numbers. This one is a little bit different. Um, EXP, uh, let me write down the uh, access code first. So EXP is the code. So this one is a little bit more, um, more obscure. <laughs> more obscure, right? All right, so I am going to describe the math behind all of this stuff here so I don't have to answer the same question like 20 times. Okay, so this is the first question. The first, quest, first, the first question really is asking, um, so we know that x times two to the power of p plus five is less than or equal to two to the power of 64 minus one and I want you to give me a, the largest value of P that is possible when X equals two, uh, 40, 
424,848. Okay, so how do you solve this problem? <laughs> Plug it in. Yep. So you can go through go to WooFrame Alpha and it will probably solve this for you. But you can also try to use algebra yourself to solve this one. In other words, uh, change this x here to exactly this constant here and then use algebra. The idea is you want to put everything, uh, you want to put 2 to the power of p only by itself on the left-hand side and move everything onto the right-hand side of the less than or equal to because as soon as you can do that, okay, so let me, can I erase this? Okay, so as soon as you have 2 to the power of p is less than or equal to some gibberish, okay, the way you solve for the p is you use log of 2. So log of 2 is something that we have already used on Tuesday. So basically, you just use log using base 2 of 2 to the power of p on this side. It becomes less than or equal to the log of 2 of whatever the rectangle is. So log 2 of 2 to the power of p is just p. So now you have this thing here, and you just have to actually calculate this number and then take the floor of that. That would become the answer of p. Is that OK? So looking at the equation here, or the inequality here, do you know how to do that? Apply algebra. So x is already known, it is 424,848, okay? So x is already known. This is a plus 5, take care of the plus 5 first, okay? Subtract 5 from both sides, so it disappears on one side. Is that okay? Next, divide both sides by x, which is 424,848. So x disappears on this side too, but this side will have a division by your 424,000 plus. So after that, then you only have 2 to the power of p on one side. You have some kind of value on the other side. That is when you apply the log of 2. And then once you apply the log of 2 to the value on the right-hand side, then you get rid of all the decimal values. So whatever integer is left is going to be the value of p. So that's for the first question. And uh, the second question is, there are only four types of questions. So once we describe your questions one to four, the rest are pretty easy. So question number two is basically doing rounding but using four. Okay. So the question is, I want you to compute the round of uh, x divided by 10. The value of x is 19.19 right here. And subtract the floor of 19.19 divided by 10. Do we have any questions about this one? Do we know what round is? So if you apply round, any decimal value of 0.5 or more rounds up. Anything that is less than 0.5 rounds down. Is that OK? And then the floor, do, we, do you guys remember what floor does? It just truncates, okay? It just gets rid of, you know, if it has point blah, 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 you just get rid of that point blah, 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 okay? So question number two should not be too much of a deep, big deal. Question number three. Oh, this one is, uh, has some resemblance to the one, one of the questions in uh, the first lab. Um, okay. So this one is giving you a certain quantity to express, which is x in this case. But I want to express the quantity of x, which is 8.321 times 10 to the power of negative 4. I want to express this in um, 2 to the power of negative 21. Okay? So that means your 2 to the power of negative, negative 21 is a unit. I'm asking how many units do I need to best estimate the value of x? So that should remind you of one of the questions in the lab on Tuesday. 
So once again, it can be over or under. I'm looking for the best estimate. Is that okay? Let me say that one more time. <laughs> Just in case. Let me say that one more time. This is all getting recorded too. I'm asking about how many in integers, okay, unsigned integers, how many 2 to the power of negative 21 would best estimate the value of 8.3521 times 10 to the power of negative 2. So how would you go about doing that? I'll give you an example, okay? I'll give you this example. Let's say we have to make a change for $1.33, okay? But all you have are dimes. So the question is really asking, how many dimes will best estimate $1.33? So how do you think of that? Okay? I'll, I'll let you guys think about that a little bit. It's a very simple math concept. And then question number four is probably the hardest because it has multiple constraints at the same time. So with this one, I have a certain value. In this case, it is 1.391 times 10 to the power of 33. Fairly large value. And I want you to give me a value in integer p so that this constraint is satisfied. I want d, which is this value, to be expressed as some x times 2 to the power of p. I don't even care what x is. Okay? But I also want to put a constraint on x. x has to be greater than or equal to 2 to the power of 52, but it has to be less than 2 to the power of 53. So the question is, how do you solve for that p? Now, this question directly relates to the conversion into a double. Okay, given any particular value, the conversion to a double can actually make use of this math. But the question is mechanically, how do you solve this problem? So I'm going to give you the answer. I'll give you the process. You still have to do it, okay? So the way you solve this problem is to say, what if x equals to the minimum that it can possibly be? In other words, you say, what if x is exactly 2 to the power of 52? Well, if we know that x is just 2 to the power of 52, we can solve this. Because b is already known. Um, x is also known because we assume it is the smallest value that it can possibly be. So we can solve for this p, which is an irrational number. It's, you know, it's going to be some number with an insane number of you know, decimal places, which is OK. Write that down. And then the second thing we do is we assume x to be the largest value that it can possibly be. So now we say, what if x is 2 to the power of 53? And you plug it in, you solve for p again. In other words, you will end up solving for p twice. Once, when x is the minimum value it can possibly be. The second time is when x is the largest value it can possibly be. So you will end up with two solutions for p. I guarantee you, there's only one integer between those two p's. That integer is the answer. All right? So all of these relate to floating point numbers because they represent different ways of looking at a double. Okay? So I'm going to stop the recording now and get it uploaded so that you guys, if you need to 